We're all familiar with the fact that the Frida Gerber tells us, Pesach Sheni teaches nitok and fafalen. There's never a lost opportunity. You can always repair. But does that really work according to the halachic application of Pesach Sheni? Not only does it, but it's the halachic perspective on Pesach Sheni that gives us a whole depth to understanding the principle of es is nitok and fafalen. When I get a Pesach Sheni, when it comes to Pesach Sheni, Yodua im Rosh Hashachak Meirad Mur, everybody knows the Friedrich Gerber's statement that Pesach Sheni Yonoi is, that the entire content and message of Pesach Sheni is, Es is Nito Kein Farfanen. Nothing is completely lost. We can always correct any circumstance, any situation. And then he goes on to say, Even if a person was impure, which could be both practically or spiritually, a person was very distant from where they needed to be. And even if it was, it was their choice. We could always repair, we could always fix it. The Rebbe is going to raise a very interesting question about this. Because it is true. That some of the commentaries and insights that Prima Satoru, the esoteric part of Torah, offers, Shema Pi Acha Sadeus Benigle de Torah, sometimes only fit with one particular perspective within Torah. In fact, sometimes the esoteric perspective will be based on an opinion that is not the opinion that is translated into practical halacha. And the reason we can do that is because at the end of the day, every part of Torah, whether it is applied in halachic practice or not, it is all part of the truth of Hashem's Torah. And if a person learns, for example, the opinion of Beis Shammai, the person would be required before learning what Beis Shammai has to say, to say the brocha over learning Torah. Even if... There's a debate between Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel, and the, the understanding is if Beis Shammai goes up against Beis Hillel, their statement is not considered a Mishnah. It's not considered to have the same validity as Beis Hillel's statement. Still, it is possible that Hasidus will explain something based on a perspective that is not the practical application of the law. So we accept that, but not in this case. Nonetheless, move on. It makes sense. It makes sense. It makes sense that if Hasidus is going to present a particular insight, that insight should fit and align also with the halachic part of Torah. Especially when you're dealing with Pesach Sheni, because what does the Friedrich Rebbe say? That this concept of Nitok and Fafalim is the core theme of what Pesach Sheni is about. So if this is the core theme, it must fit and align even according to the halachic, or especially according to the halachic perspective. Now, but when you think of it, it's a three-way debate in the Gemara. See, if I go with the opinion in the Gemara that says that Pesach Sheni is just a way to compensate if we missed something at the beginning at the first Pesach, then Muverna saw Amira ben Gela Pesach Sheni, then we could understand how when it comes to Pesach Sheni, we say, Shinyonu, it's not talking for fun. Then we could say, the, the message of Pesach Sheni is nothing is ever completely lost. And that would make perfect sense if all we wanted to illustrate was that Pesach Sheni is the catch-up for Pesach Rishon. You can always fill in what was missed first time around. Likewise, the other opinion in the Gemara which says, it's not that Pesach Sheni comes to complete what was missing if you missed the first Pesach, but it actually comes to correct something that went wrong on the first Pesach, for which a person was actually liable for a punishment. You could now go after the fact and correct it. That means that the Torah presented a way to correct a mistake, which is through bringing the Pesach Sheni. Even for a person who deliberately did not bring a Pesach Rishon and therefore deserved to be punished, yet the Torah gives them an escape clause, you can do Pesach Sheni and fix it all. Fits perfectly. But the third view in the Gemara, which is actually the view that is relevant to the practical halacha, Rebbe says, Pesach Sheni is technically a, an independent yomtiv. 
And technically, Pesach Sheni is not contingent on the first Pesach. It stands on its own foundation. Now, if that's the definition of Pesach Sheni, that it has its own value independent of whatever may or may not have happened first time around on Pesach, how can you say that such a festival that stands on its own merits its core value is this all about correcting and filling in the gaps and making up for what went wrong. Why? It's regal bifnei atzmoi. It's got its own chatech aruli yiskabed. It's got its own value. Now, but Pashas B'yoy says a kushya. You could immediately say it's not really a big question. Let's even go with Rebbe's opinion that Pesach Sheni is technically its own independent yontav. The reality still remains that Pesach Sheni Urak Nobody will debate the fact that Pesach Sheni is only an obligation for the person who missed Pesach when they were supposed to have brought the Pesach, the the, the Korban Pesach. And not only that, Mishikir Pesach Berishan also loy lahavi Pesach Sheni. If somebody had brought the Pesach the Korban Pesach at the right time, they would be forbidden from bringing, bringing a Korban Pesach on Pesach Sheni. Let's say that somebody chose deliberately not to bring the Korban Pesach when it was originally Pesach. Then, and we allow that person now to bring the Korban Pesach a month later on Pesach Sheni and thereby exempt themselves from the punishment, which is Koris, which is a pretty serious punishment. So if that's the case, so so if that's the case, then we could say in such a governor died that even according to Rebbe, Yonash of Pesach Sheni, who isn't talking for fun, that Pesach Sheni, even though it is considered an independent yontem, but it is related to Pesach Rishon, and it is related to getting rid of the Chiyuv Kores, or the fact that you didn't bring the Pesach the first time around, and therefore, okay, we talking for fun. And actually, if you go back to the story of how Pesach Sheni originated, that is the story. It's It's the story of Hashem introducing a brand new mitzvah that was not originally part of the Torah with the sole purpose of helping people to fix something that went wrong. It was because they said, we don't want to be pushed away. So Hashem said, okay, you won't be pushed away, even though you were impure. And for which Hashem gave the, 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 the instruction, if a person will be impure, or distant from the base Hamikdash, even if it's deliberately going. In the next month of Iyar, on the 14th day, you bring the current Pesach. Now, the fact is that Rebbe still says it's its own yomtiv. It would seem that really what Rebbe wants us to know is that if a person missed the Korban Pesach Sheni, then that would implicate them to be Chayv Koris. Meaning, let's say that it was a scenario where a person either inadvertently or because of circumstances outside of their control, could not bring the Pesach sacrifice when it was the original Pesach. Then, if that same person now chooses deliberately not to bring Pesach Sheni, they would now be, um, they, they would be liable for Koris, which is a very serious punishment. So in other words, that's what Rebbe wants us to know, that the second Pesach is powerful enough to uh, implicate a person in a chi of chorus. Okay, so maybe we've got our answer. The theme of Pesach Sheni is catch up for what you missed at the first Pesach, and the technical reason why it's considered its own yontiv is because there is a scenario where that would be practical and relevant in knowing how a person is going to be, um, what consequences they're going to face for choosing not to bring the Pesach Sheni when they should have. And I said, in a movement, but that's still not a good enough answer because I'll only time Zesh, I'll be who. Look at what happens. Once you go with Rebbe's thinking, and you say that Pesach Sheni is its own independent yontif. So Sfir the Rebbe, based on that, Rebbe's opinion is, and the Rambam actually decides that this is the practical aloha, is as follows. If a person converts to Judaism between 
the first Pesach and the second Pesach. Or a child who reaches Bar Mitzvah age after Pesach, before Pesach Sheni. Chayav Lasis Pesach Sheni, those individuals have to bring a second Korban Pesach. In other words, Vim Kain. What's it saying? That the second Pesach, Pesach Sheni, is its own independent Yontav that doesn't always rely on what had happened by the first Pesach. So if that's the case, if we look in the context of either a convert to Judaism or a person who reaches the Bar Mitzvah between Pesach and Pesach Sheni, how could we say that for them, that the whole Pesach Sheni is all about catching up what was lost? Nothing was lost. They were not obligated to bring that carbon Pesach the first time around. So they didn't lose anything. They don't have to compensate anything. They don't have to correct anything. And yet they bring a carbon Pesach Sheni. You can't tell me that the Pesach Sheni is fixing the past. Okay, the truth is when it comes to a child, maybe it's a little bit easier to explain. When it comes to a child who reaches Bar Mitzvah between Pesach and Pesach Sheni, we say now he has to bring a Korban Pesach when he hits Pesach Sheni. We could find a way to squeeze an answer, which is, We could explain how for that child, he really is compensating for something that was lost at the first Pesach. Why? The halach is that in order to eat the carbon Pesach, you have to allocate who will participate in that carbon Pesach before Pesach comes in. And only Limnuyov, only those who are allocated to eat from this carbon Pesach will be allowed to eat from it. Now you do include children in that allocation. In fact, there's even an opinion that says that there has to be a lamb allocated for the entire family is a biblical requirement. Serum is more than that. Rambam Posak, the Rambam says, Alachically, Im, Shim Shok to Alova la Cotton Berishan, Potomi Pesach Shani. The Rambam says, If in fact the family shechted the Korban, the Korban Pesach Rishan, with her in mind, with the child in mind, that child does not have to bring Pesach Shani if he hits by mitzvah subsequently. In other words, Harish Yesh Rishaychas the Mitzvah's Korban Bar Pesach. Whichever way you look at it, a child prior to Bar Mitzvah is already in some way part of the Pesach ceremony even while a child. So in that case, if they did not include him in the original Korban Pesach, and he hit by mitzvah age before Pesach Sheni, then if we say that this child, now an adult, has to bring the Korban Pesach Sheni, it actually is saying he has to compensate something that wasn't done. He was meant to have been included in the original Pesach, and he wasn't. So now when he brings the Korban Pesach as an independent over by mitzvah, for child, then he is actually saying that what was lost can be recouped. He could fix up the what was lacking by the fact that they didn't include him in the carbon Pesach Rishon. Okay, so we can squeeze an answer. I'm an Egele Gersh and his guy, but if you want to try and answer anything like that about a convert, who at the time of the original Korban Pesach had no connection. In fact, he wasn't allowed to participate in the Korban Pesach because he's not a Geri, he's, he's an RL. RL is a, an uncircumcised individual, he's not allowed to eat from the Korban Pesach. Now he gets the chance to bring a Korban Pesach at Pesach Sheni. If the entire thing of Pesach Sheni is only and, 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 and exclusively about this, and he took him Fafalan, what was Fafalan for him? What was lost that he's now catching up? So the explanation is, aha, that's because we've totally looked at this in a superficial way. Now let's look at it properly. To the contrary, to what we thought. The fact that Rebbe calls Pesach Sheni its own standalone yontiv, when Rebbe says that Pesach Sheni is its own independent yontif, he's actually highlighting the extent to which es is nitok and fafalen, nothing can ever be lost, in a greater way than Rebbe Nossan or Rebbe Hananya Berakavia, who were the two opinions who said either the Pesach Sheni compensates for a gap in the Pesach Rishon or corrects a mistake of the Pesach Rishon. Why? The fear that there is through Tashlum in derision and Takanta derision, whether you go with Rebbe Nossan or Rebbe um, um, 
What's the name of it? Rechanania ben Akavia. Whichever opinion you go with, at the end of the day, what they're saying is Pesach Sheni fills in or corrects something that was wrong with Pesach Rishon. In other words, what are they saying? The best and most appropriate time to bring a Korban Pesach is the first Pesach. If somebody missed that, If a person missed it, the Torah creates an opportunity for this individual to compensate for what they missed, to fix what they wrecked. But in their view, the Torah hasn't introduced another time that is appropriate for a Korban Pesach, just an allowance to catch up. Whereas when you look from the perspective of Rebbe, and look at the language he uses, it is a time of Yom Tov. Pesach Sheni is a time of Yom Tov. Rebbe is telling us, in addition to the fact that the Torah designated a Yom Tov in Nisan called Pesach, it also designated a time of Yom Tov and a time for the Korban Pesach in Iyar, which is called Pesach Sheni. Therefore, if a person does bring the Korban Pesach Sheni in Iyar on the 14th of Iyar, Yeshkan, what happens there is, not only does he compensate for what he hadn't done, which was to bring the Korban Pesach, this is a self-sustaining, independent action of bringing a Korban Pesach. Because according to Rebbe, Yudalad Ir is a valid time for bringing a Korban Pesach. It's not just a plug-in or a compensation or a catch-up. It is a valid time to do everything that you could have done at the first Pesach. In other words, the Das Rebbe, from Rebbe's perspective, the fact that a person would be obligated to bring the Korban Pesach Sheni would not be because he owes a responsibility to Hashem. He was meant to have brought a Korban Pesach in the first Pesach and he didn't. Which would be the other opinions, Rabbi Nosan and Rabbi Hanani and Rabbi They would have said that it's, it's all about you know, catching up a debt, so to speak, a spiritual debt that you owe. Rebbe is saying, Rebbe is saying, the 14th of year is a date on the calendar that requires a Korban Pesach. Had a person not already brought it previously. And obviously, if a person did bring the Korban Pesach at the correct time, they don't bring a Korban Pesach Sheni. Then why is that? Because everybody acknowledges, and it's very self-evident, that there's only one Korban to celebrate Yitzhak Mitzrayim. So if you've already brought it, you've brought it. But it's not that that was the only time to bring it. This is a valid time to bring the Korban Pesach. And if you get to bring a Korban Pesach Sheni for whatever reason, it is not just a filler, it's the equivalent of Pesach. So therefore, from Rebbe's perspective, the idea that Pesach Sheni is that nothing is lost. In the intention is, It's not only telling us you can always catch up, always fix. Or or that you can, in a generalized sense, catch up what you didn't get to do before. Rebbe saying, that Pesach Sheni is showing us that if a person gets that second opportunity, it is an opportunity to fill in every single relevant detail of that particular Pesach. And doing the Pesach Sheni is 100% a whole version of Korban Pesach as it would have been at the first Pesach. Now that will tell us something spectacular about the ger. So let's look at the person who converts. Between the original Pesach and Pesach Sheni. Or the cotton shigdom and Pesach Sheni. Or a kid who hits his bar mitzvah before Pesach Sheni. 
Shatam Shechayom in Lasses Pesach Sheni, the reason why the halacha is that those individuals now have to bring a carbon on Pesach Sheni, Avshalo Echsiris Asias Pesach Rishon, which as we said, why should they have to? They didn't miss the opportunity first time around. Isn't Pesach Sheni only for somebody who missed the opportunity first time around? They didn't miss it, they couldn't do it. It's because the concept of Pesach Sheni is not just catching up what was lost, but it is a current obligation that begins now on the 14th of year, independently of what happened on Pesach. And that is directly relevant to a convert or to a child. The way they are now as an adult or as a Jewish person on the 14th of year, they're chayev to do every mitzvah, including this mitzvah of a Korban Pesach, which is now 100% relevant, regardless of whether there was a lack, misguided behavior, or a bad choice. So, Pianel, based on this, we're going to take the word Tashlumin, which is how we generally understand what Pesach Sheni is all about, to complete or to fill in what was lost before. And we'll see the word Tashlumin actually has two meanings to it. Rebbe also will say that Pesach Sheni falls into the category of Tashlumin, except he translates Tashlumin differently to how the other opinions in the Gemara do. There are two ways you could interpret the word. Aleph, which is what immediately comes to mind, that what, what it means for a person to be mashlim is something was missing and now we fill it in, so now it's complete. Or it could mean base shlemus, reaching the ultimate state. Meaning, even if nothing was missing or lacking, what we're going to do now is we're going to upgrade the entire experience by what we add on to take it to a new level of completion. And we see this in other areas of Torah as well. Let's use the expression about Tamima with regards to a year when you're trying to work out the age of an animal, for example. So the Gemara tells us when we're told that an animal has to be Tamima, that has to be a perfect year, that means even if it's a leap year. Isn't that interesting? A year that is not a leap year is also a complete year. Nothing's missing, yet a year with the leap month is now called Tamima, complete. Why is it more complete than the other? That's the point. Tashlumin could mean you take something which is already complete and upgrade it to another level of completion. We also see this with regards to the different services that the Kohanim had to do in the Beis HaMikdash. Certain kinds of service are considered incomplete. And what defines an avoider as incomplete? If there's another step of avoider that has to follow it, Kigoin, for example, slaughtering the animal, gathering the blood of the animal, taking the blood of the animal to the Mizbech are all considered incomplete because those steps will only be completed when the Koyan sprinkles the blood onto the, onto the Mizbech. Vila avoida tamo, whereas a complete avoida is avoida shi adavra, something that completely ends or brings the whole process to its fruition. Ki zrika, like sprinkling the blood, haktora, bringing the keteris, vinisachamayim, pouring the water onto the misbech, vachol, etc., many other examples. Now, avshari chosu dove betzam avoida, nothing was lacking in the shechita. It wasn't an imperfect avoida. Shedesa ki deboi, it was done absolutely as it should have been. It, it checked all the boxes of exactly what the halacha requires. It's not considered whole. Because there's another avoid, completely independent of it, that brings it to its ultimate state of fruition and completion. And it's that subsequent step of avoid that brings everything to its completion. It completes, it rounds off, it elevates the steps that preceded it. Is a practical application. Even though a non kohen is warned very clearly in the Torah that they dare not perform any of the services of a korban, they are not penalized 
with the death penalty unless they do what is considered an avoid a tamo, which means that there's a practical difference between something that is complete and something that is in the ultimate state of completion. It's quite similar to what we see with tzedakah, the two elements of tzedakah. On the one hand, the Torah tells us you have to compensate what the person is lacking. Which basically means you give him what he needs in order to survive. Then the Torah says, which is subjective, you have to compensate for what is lacking to him. There we say, if he came from a very wealthy background and it was used to riding a horse with a page boy in front of him, we have to get him back to that level of wealth. And then even beyond that, that you give a person to the point that we actually make the person wealthy, even that's, if that's not something that he originally experienced, so he doesn't feel he's lacking it. So now let's have a look at what Al Gemara says about Pesach Sheni. Eina Sheni Tashlumin Lerish and Rebbe says Pesach Sheni is not what, so to speak, fills in the gaps of the first Pesach at a regal bifnei atzmoi, but it's its own standalone yomtiv. That means who Sheni Tashlumin Sugzeshi non Lashem Lesachoser. When Rebbe says it's not Tashlumin, what he's saying is the purpose of Pesach Sheni is not to fill in the gaps that were left after the first Pesach. It has its own reality, which takes the whole Pesach experience and shows you how it is good and could become better. That's why you have a person who converts to Judaism and it's still called Tashlumin. Now, how could it be Tashlumin in the classical sense? Prior to becoming a Ger, he was forbidden from bringing a Korban Pesach. And we call Mokim, isn't he talking for fun? And yet we say, but it's not a lost opportunity. Not only can he now technically bring the carbon on Pesach Sheni, but it gives him the full experience, the 100% valid experience of carbon Pesach, even though it's on Pesach Sheni. Just to get a better appreciation of this, we'll have a look at quite a well-known quotation from the Chidot. Why we call a convert a convert who converts. Not a Gentile who converts. Even though we speak about a slave who is freed. Or a child who becomes a, a, an adult. Why do we not acknowledge the fact that he's non-Jewish? Because the Chidah tells us that even before the person goes through the process of conversion, assuming, of course, that it is a valid conversion, they are already a convert, even before it begins, to some extent. Meaning, that in spite of the fact that the person lives as a Gentile, they have the spark of a holy Jewish soul. It's just that that spark cannot really express itself and cannot be part of their day-to-day life until they go through the valid conversion process. So if there's that spark, Venimta, then it emerges, Shigama Pesach Rishon, that even when the first Pesach came about, and he was not yet Jewish, he still had some personal connection to the carbon Pesach due to the spark within himself. And therefore, Pesach Sheni, who had Tashlumin, Pesach Sheni is not just, okay, here's a second chance, and because you weren't able to do it the first time around, now you get to do it. But it's Tashlumin Milushon Shleimos, it completes the initial superficial connection that he had to the carbon Pesach when it was the first Pesach and he wasn't yet Jewish. Now that gets completed into a full-blown connection and responsibility and mitzvah. We can take it even deeper. If we have one word that has two meanings, Tashlumin could mean to catch up or to compensate what was lacking or you could say Tashlomin means to bring something to its absolute perfection if they both are interpretations of one word move on then there must be a link even when we translate Tashlomin as bringing something to its absolute perfection that is very much related to the idea of compensating for what may have been lost let's explain let's Seeing as somebody is in a situation, where they have the capacity to be able to receive something more. 
So we'll say that because the person could theoretically get more, we could technically say they're lacking the more they could get. So therefore we could say, so what is shlemus? What is perfection for this person? Not necessarily what they're used to, what they had, what they potentially could get. Let's explain this in physical terms. If you could give somebody real wealth. If he has now lived a wealthy lifestyle and become accustomed to it. Everybody will agree that that is no longer considered something extra in his life. It's now become the norm of his life. And therefore, if it's taken away from him, he'll feel that it's lacking in his life. And therefore, we have an obligation to compensate him. I feel ever Lawrence the fun of even to have that page boy running in front of his horse. Now, similar kind of thing is going to apply in the spiritual realm. Let's say that somebody had spiritual wealth, just like that person had physical wealth. If it would then be taken from that person, they would feel a tremendous lack. So in a sense, as soon as a person starts to think about having that spiritual wealth and starts to yearn for that spiritual wealth, at that moment, what is born inside that person is lack. The lack of, I'm missing that, I want it. It implies that I'm missing it. Because as we know, the Baal Shem Tov tells us, wherever a person's true will and motivation lies, that's actually where they live. So then, then as soon as the person wants to have that perfection of spiritual experience, just the fact that they want it, even if they've never experienced it before, already makes it something which is now lacking in their life. And when they are eventually given that particular wealth, it's not only tashlumin in the sense of reaching the ultimate state, it's simultaneously the tashlumin in the classical sense of filling in a lack. And Eivisha knows the reality. That here's a person who really, not, not only one person, but 50 pages running in front of him, is technically something that this person could have had in their life and could have felt was lacking from them. Except that here on the physical plane, we can't see that because we've only seen this guy with one page running in front of him. And therefore the way we play out the halachi in practical terms here on earth is, at which point can we say that a person is lacking something? If he used to have it and he was used to it. But in spiritual terms, the Epishter can see what we should have had and what we should achieve. And if we don't have that beautiful, perfect spiritual reality, it could be considered in the Epishter's eyes that it's something we're missing and needs to be compensated. So now let's go back to our convert who converts between Pesach and Pesach Sheni. Seeing as we've already identified that even before he goes through the practical process of the conversion, he is technically, in some sense, a ger. Because even prior to the gerus, he has the spark of this holy soul. So what do we know in our world? In our world, we can only see the person who went through the conversion process. So now we know that that spark was real. That's our limitation. But the truth is when that happens, when that conversion is completed, we can now retroactively see that this person always had a meaningful relationship with mitzvahs. So that means that when this convert now brings the Pesach Sheni, it's not just bonus. He's gone to a higher level of completion because he's done a mitzvah that he didn't have to do at the original Pesach. 
It's actually more than that. Ela shadovaf mashnu mesachaser. It's actually filling in a gap that he had in his life. Kemit shemitzad on neshama because from his neshama's perspective, achena yachaser lebakrovas hapesach bepesach rishon. There was really something missing in his life when he didn't bring the original korban pesach, even though he couldn't bring the original korban pesach. But because he had some type of a spiritual connection already to the korban pesach, it was missing in his life. He just didn't know it. So bringing the korban pesach sheni not only upgrades his life, but it actually compensates for something that should have been there all along. That has a lesson for each of us. What's the lesson? How much we have to invest in spreading Torah and spreading Yiddishkeit, or and particularly spreading Hasidus. A person could argue in his own mind, I think it's really important to spread Yiddishkeit and spread Hasidus. But that's like higher grade Judaism. You know, it's, it's, it's not for everybody. If he engages in spreading Torah, it will elevate and upgrade his Jewish experience to a higher level. But it's not urgent, right? Well, no, nobody should tell me that it's absolutely critical or that it's absolutely urgent. So a person might think. To which we respond, that there might be things in our spirituality that we see as only bonus, they'll only upgrade our spirituality. It's quite possible that it's not just an upgrade, that it's actually going to fill in a gap in that person's life. Something that is essential to that person, to their spirituality, to their soul's development. Like the well-known teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, that sends a soul down into this world. To live in this world for 70, 80 years. And the entire purpose of its sojourn on this earth is to be able to do a favor for another Jewish person, materially and certainly spiritually. In other words, he talking if it's possible. It's possible that this favor that you have to do to this Jewish person on this particular day, he he tachlis yiridas nishmas eloilamaze. That could be the one thing for which the person's neshama had to enter this world. And if the person misses that opportunity, not only will they miss a chance to upgrade to a bonus level, a better level of spirituality, it could be that the person will lose everything. The whole reason why the Neshama came there. And seeing as none of us know what, when, how, and no person knows which was the thing that the Neshama had to enter this world for. Therefore, So every one of us has to grab at every opportunity to spread Yiddishkeit because we don't know which is going to be the one. With that attitude and that input, we'll be able to merit the complete Geula, the true and complete Geula. And Shlema here will have both meanings of Tashlom. All of the things that were lacking during Golos will be compensated and completed. And then the world will be upgraded and elevated to an even higher level of perfection, greater than it was even prior to the sin of the Eitz Adas. Which is described as the world as it was created, the, the, the so-called elements of the world that were all created perfect. And that word toldos is written without a vav. And from that we get to Eilat toldos peretz mole, to the generations that were born from peretz, who is the progenitor of Mashiach. And their toldos is written complete, meaning what? The world is upgraded to a high level of completion. Veloshen Harambam, as the Rambam puts it, man in the time of Mashiach, lo yesham lo yirav, lo milcham, lo kinev sachros. There'll be no famine, there'll be no war, there'll be no envy, there'll be no competition. And that's the first type of shleimus, that nothing will be missing. And then in addition to which he says, good things will be completely ubiquitous. 
and the occupation of the entire world will be nothing else but simply to know Hashem, Shlemus Mamish, which is real Shlemus. Natural will happen because of Mamish, speedily, with the coming of Mashiach now.